Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Diego Cuti, and thank you for your time. Uh, before starting, I want to do a couple of quick uh, elements. First of all, uh, all the slides will be available for anyone to ask. For questions, I ask you to wait until the Q&A section. And, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, in the first slide, you can find my LinkedIn profile. Feel free to add me if you have any question further, you want to talk, uh, uh, you have doubts, uh, anything. Feel free to add me. I'm always happy to help uh, anybody. So let's jump into it. So who am I? I am the current, I'm the Acuity, and currently I'm the course leader of the game design degree in both Rome and Milan in AIV. I'm also the lead designer at Kaka Games. I also worked as publisher designer at the Ignition Publishing. I'm also uh, the creative director of Donate, the first donation game ever made. We're going to talk about that. I was the lead uh, designer in Techland. I have been designing in Ubisoft. I graduated uh, at the University of Suffolk. And I also worked as uh, level designer at Digi4. Now you're thinking, who cares? And you're right, it's not important, but actually it's slightly important because one of these experience is the reason why I can do this talk. But don't worry, there's a ton of juice, so let's jump into it. Now, motivation. Now, when we're talking about motivation, most of the time people think about this, which is the pyramid of motivation, the mark of pyramid. Now, when we in this talk are talking about motivation, we're actually talking on this element the one that are present in safety, love, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. We are currently not talking on psycho, um, psychological, uh, physiological, sorry, uh, motivation. Not because it's not relevant, it's incredibly relevant, but just because at the moment, at least, video game cannot provide physiological motivation. With physiological motivation, what we usually think is, uh, um, sex reliefs, uh, food, uh, uh, not starving, sleeping, and things like that. So at the moment, I'm not talking about the future, but at the moment, video games cannot provide psycho uh, physiological motivation. They can provide safety motivation, which is usually not fearing of losing your job or having a job, uh, not fearing that, I don't know, your house will crumble, having money, uh, feeling good within the society or the group that you belong, uh, love and belonging, which is uh, interaction with other people. So love in the sense of course, uh, romantic love, but also in the sense of uh, friendship, uh, uh, work, uh, meaning, uh, be part of your nation, esteem in the sense of all the elements from self-esteem to other people's esteem. So, you know, feeling good about what you're doing, feeling competent with what you're doing, feeling meaningful, and finally, self-actualization. So become the best that you can be, whatever that it means. Now, all these elements, self, steam, belonging, and safety can be provided by games in certain ways. Now, it depends on the game. Not all game must provide any of these. Entertainment, it's novel, and uh, that's always something that we need to remember. But other games can provide one of these, many of these can change the world. For example, many people, thanks to World of Warcraft, and I do know personally, have found the love of their life. Uh, they met friends. I met many of my best friends thanks to video games, or in any case, the digital world. I, thanks once again to video games, I am in the self-actualization area. My job, my career is based on that. I'm becoming the best in what I do and I love what I do. Now, when we're also talking about motivation, people talk of intrinsic motivation and extrinsic, sorry, extrinsic motivation. Now, these are fine. This is something that we can talk and we will talk today. Now, intrinsic motivation is usually connected to things that people enjoy doing. What I mean by that is, uh, for example, your passion could, could be playing video game or making video game, or maybe the sports that you love. Maybe you love watching that sport. Maybe you love watching uh, soccer or football or baseball, or maybe you love practice those sports, or maybe both. Uh, it could be art 
maybe you are making, I don't know, photograph or painting, not as a job, but it's something that you find intrinsically rewarding. So when you're doing these activities or when you're reading or anything else, you find those enjoyable. Uh, no one has to pay, no one has to give you anything because those are great on their own. They are now very important to understand in intrinsic motivation is the fact that it's different from each person. Okay, so what is intrinsic motivating to me might be incredibly boring or uh, actually annoying or even hurting both physiological and psychological to you. Extreme motivation instead, it's actually way more uh, broadly shared. So what is usually a string thing motivating for a person is usually a string thing motivating for other persons too. Uh, now, there are some cultural differences, for example, Western centric culture like the USA, Europe, find, for example, money highly extrinsic motivating, while East culture like I don't know, Japan or China uh, might find money less motivating, or at least in the past. Now, uh, lots of uh, Eastern uh, countries are actually, they got uh, Western uh, values. But in general, Extrinsic motivation are things like winning. So, you know, the sensation of being, I'm the best. Uh, perks, what mean with perks? Really anything, uh, uh, any adventure, advantage or something or bonus that you have and other people don't have. Prizes, uh, cups, you know, I'm the best at doing this. I want this. Uh, benefits, promotion, uh, money and bonuses. Uh, all these elements are extrinsic motivation. So it's something that gives motivation to us and we like it, but is uh, depending on the result. And that is the main difference between intrinsic and extrinsic. In intrinsic, we enjoy the action. We enjoy the act of doing that, uh, even if the result is bad or even uh, useless. For example, um, I love taking pictures, but I don't show this picture to anyone. I'm not going, I don't put my pictures on Instagram. I don't put my pictures on, uh, I don't know, a museum. Uh, I just enjoy the act of going around and taking pictures. While for example, in uh, my job, I make games because I enjoy making games, but also I want people to play my games. So I want extreme motivation. I want my game to be good, to be recognized as a good game. Now, something that you often say about intrinsic and extrinsic, extrinsic motivation is that intrinsic is good and extrinsic is bad. But this is completely, totally wrong. Now, sorry for burning your eyes with this kind of giant glowing red thing, but I really need to get this inside your head. This is absolutely wrong. There is not such a thing as a wrong type of motivation. Both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation are good, but the point is that they serve different purposes and they aren't mutually exclusive. Now, what I mean by that is that you can use extrinsic motivation to motivate certain type of people to doing certain type of tasks and extrinsic motivation to motivate certain type of people at doing certain type of tasks. You can have both together. As I said before, my job is like that. I'm also intrinsically motivated by my job because I love making games, but I also want people to recognize that my games are good. So I want extrinsic motivation. I want you know, meta, good Metacritic. I want uh, good reviews. I want uh, uh, people that comment on forums, oh, this game is great and things like that. Now, what I mean by they are not mutually exclusive, I mean like they can work together, but, and that is very important, there, all, there should be always a dominant, a dominant one between the two. Uh, you can have extrinsic motivation and then intrinsic motivation and have one of the two dominate on the other, yes, but you can't have them at the same level because something can't be exactly intrinsically motivating and exactly at the same level extrinsically motivating. It just doesn't work uh, because as literally is how made our, uh, our brain is made, we value things differently. So therefore it's impossible to have them at the same time. And when you are designing motivation, and that is the topic that we are talking today, how to motivate people and link it to monetization, 
When you are motivating people, you need to understand what does motivate them. Because if what motivates them is extrinsic, that's where you have to push. You have to give them extrinsic value, like money, like rewards, like you are the best. If is intrinsic motivation that leads them, then you have to push on that. It means that you don't uh, you you don't give them coins at the end of something. No, you give them coins. That's fine. But the intrinsic part is way stronger, or vice versa, the extrinsic part is way stronger. You need to choose one side, and now we will see how. So, well, how should I choose between all the two? How can I understand which one is the good one and which one is the bad one for my specific case? Uh, let's start with intrinsic. So, intrinsic is great for creativity. So if something, if you're asking the player or you're asking someone to do a task, to do a job, to do something that has creativity involved into it, uh, any level of creativity. Now, with creativity, many people think, oh, I don't know, they have to paint. Uh, yes, but also programming can be creative. Like uh, creativity is a broad, broad element. When you need to think outside of the box, when you need to solve wicked problems, when you need to find a cool way, a twisted way to, uh, to solve something, when the process is less relevant than the result, then is creativity. And creativity is highly boosted by intrinsic motivation. Uh, uh, sorry, this vice versa. Intrinsic motivation, highly boosted uh, creativity. Mastery, that's the same thing. Becoming good at something, uh, like, I don't know, learning an instrument, uh, uh, learning how to read really fast, learning how to type, learn a new language, master a new language, all these type of elements that require consistent work and positive thinking are highly, highly boosted by intrinsic. So if the task that you are assigned to the player, if that, uh, the job that the player has to do is linked with mastery, once again, intrinsic motivation is your type of motivation. Stickiness. Uh, of course, with stickiness, uh, we uh, uh, intend the self-sustained element, something that you enjoy doing it, so you are doing it even if people don't pay you, even if people think that you are really bad at it, even if people tell you that you shouldn't do it, uh, even if it's time-consuming. So if stickiness is something that interests you, in, for example, mobile, this is usually called uh, retention. If uh, highly stick, high stickiness or high retention is something that interests you, then intrinsic motivation, it's good. Social, collaboration and teamwork. Now, why I mean collaboration and teamwork? Intrinsic motivation is good only, only for collaboration and teamwork. If your game is competitive, intrinsic motivation is not a good type of a motivation. If your game is about collaboration, it's about teamwork, it's about doing things together, win together, it's about finding the common ground, it's about uh, um, putting the extra mile for someone else. You know, if it's uh, all for one and one for all, then intrinsic motivation is good. Extrinsic motivation is good for compliance. Now, if you want your uh, player to do exactly what you told him, her, to do, like I want you to go there, click this button, do this, stop. Or maybe it's a job, you know, I want you to take this letter, bring it to the guy, talk to the guy, uh, go back, done. If you want compliance, extrinsic motivation is good. It actually leads to compliance because people know that they have to do exactly these steps to get the reward. Routine is great with the extrinsic. If you're trying to put routines like habit loop, operant conditioning, or uh, feedback in uh, ignited routines, like, uh, I don't know, doing a job, uh, or wake up in the morning at a certain time, or, I don't know, uh, starting to work out in the morning, things like that. Anything that it needs to become a routine, so it needs to become something that you do every single X amount of time, extrinsic motivation is great too. Because, because once again, it's another form of compliance. Because routine, it's triggered compliance, triggered by something. Could be a notification, could be the sound of your alarm clock, could be uh, a specific amount of time. 
incentivization. Uh, if you need to incentivize someone, you know, if you need some, to convince someone to do the first step into a direction, you know, if you need someone to maybe it's scared uh, of this activity, it's, uh, it's scared of doing something, of maybe being bad at something, a string sync motivation is fantastic as intense incentivization method. It's absolutely great. Give a reward by doing the first step. Maybe then they will still hate the activity, you know? It could be absolutely that after they're doing the activity, they think, you know what, I did the activity, I hated the activity, done. That's still possible, but at least they tried the activity by doing an incentivization. Um, I really want to think about that point. Think about when you were a kid. Usually this type of in uh, motivation with extrinsic incentivization is used by parents to convince kids to do stuff. They uh, usually think that the parents think they're good for kids, like, uh, oh, you should go and play with these kids. Ah, but they will hate me. I don't want to do it. You know what? If you're doing it, I'm going to cook your favorite dish tonight. Ah, great, I'm going to do it. Or, you know, you should go to that camp uh, for doing something. Ah, no, it's going to be bad. It's going to be raining. I don't want to do it. You know what? I give you $5. And then maybe they love it. They are great time. Because it's that. Interesting motivation. It's fantastic to be the foot in the door. Finally, extrinsic motivation is fantastic for solo works. What I mean by solo work, I mean you work alone or you generally work in a team, but you have less interaction, independent interdependencies with other people. They are really good for uh, not working with others. Why? We will see now the reason. Now, it seems fantastic, right? It seems, okay, well, there you go. Awesome, right? Just, just intrinsic motivation is awesome. Extrinsic motivation is awesome. So why not every single thing in the world is made by intrinsic motivating uh, things or extrinsic motivating rewards? Well, because there are risks linked to intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, and they need to be addressed, to be discovered, to be understood in order to use them properly. Let's start with this again with intrinsic. Now, intrinsic motivation is linked with passion or interest at least. What I mean by that is that if you don't have a passion or if you can't convey a passion or an interest into an activity, it will never be, never be intrinsically motivated, motivatingly. So the risk in that is that you cannot necessarily control what is a passion of the user? What is his, her passion? You know, as I say, my passion, for example, is photography, movies, but someone else can find those things boring. Uh, for example, I found uh, soccer incredibly boring, and I'm Italian, <laughs> uh, and I love swimming. Uh, so you can control that. Now, you can mitigate this risk by understanding more your target audience. By understanding more your target audience, you can already understand that activity it's for at least the majority of your audience could be intrinsically motivating or not so that's why it's so important but it's a risk because if you pick the wrong activity by thinking that was intrinsically motivating it and it's not you're not going to get any action any traction from the player because passion it's what drives intrinsic motivation the second is feedback intrinsic motivation requires constant constructive Feedback. Now, I want to be very clear on construct and constructive feedback. It needs to be constant. Any action of the player needs to receive a feedback. Any activity of the community needs a feedback. Any activity at large of community needs a feedback. Any single activity needs a feedback, which requires huge teams or at least prepared teams be able to have, you know, community manager. They need to have people that answer questions on the forums. You need to have in-game or in-app uh, feedback. You need to uh, have a system that push both within your team and the community constructive feedback, which is incredibly difficult. And you need to have that at a constant level. Intrinsic motivation without constant feedback leads to depletion. People get annoyed. People think that they are not appreciated for what they are doing. Now, 
Another important element of constructive feedback is not saying you are good, you are great, you are fantastic, you're awesome, you're the best. That's just positive feedback. Constructive feedback can be negative, but constructive feedback always aims to explain how to get better. So you did wrong, I'm not gonna punish you for doing wrong, I'm not gonna mock you for doing wrong, but I'm going to explain how to get good. And that is very difficult, especially in community management. As probably we are all known, uh, toxicity is a strong element in almost any game uh, that has multiplayer into. Last element, you need to feel relevant. You need to feel appreciated. Now, appreciated, once again, it doesn't mean you're great, you're good, you're awesome, and things like that. Being relevant, it's really the best way to sing. You need to see that your activity, that what you are doing, has an impact, as an effect on the overall experience that you are having or other people is having, if this is, for example, highly connected to multiplayer and things like that. You need to feel your impact. You don't, don't necessarily need to feel incredibly appreciated by your impact, but you need to feel that I did this, this was important. Extrinsic motivation instead, the risk are value. Now, when you are using extrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation, you always need to have a value of the reward that exceed the perceived fatigue of the task. Now, this seems obvious, you know, I need to give you more money than what you think this task is costing you. But it's not really that, and that's why exceed is in all caps lock. Not because I want to uh, scream at you, but because it really express how this is important. You need to exceed the value. And by meaning that, it means that you need to exceed it by a lot. If I tell you that this thing is going to cost you two hours of your time, and you know that two hours of time are like, I don't know, let's say uh, $10 random. And... Uh, I give you $11, that's not good enough. I mean, yes, I'm exceeding your technically self-imposed uh, value of your time, but not by enough, especially if the task that I'm asking you is not linked to, sorry, let's go back very quickly, unless, especially if I'm asking you to one of these. Because if it's a, a physiological task, then you will do it because you don't want to die. You know, you need food. Uh, uh, once again, you need the sexual uh, relief. Uh, you need uh, uh, not dying of, of uh, freezing. But the more we're going up into the pyramid, the higher needs to exceed. Because this value, while are seeing as more important, so we perceive them as as more important, we all want self-actualization, we all want self-esteem, we also know internally that we can live without them, and that's why they are higher on the top, because we consider them more important, but we know that we can also avoid them. Let's say, well, this time, you know what, I prefer not having self-actualization and invest this time into, I don't know, buying the grocery that I need, because otherwise I'm going to go starve. So we know they are more important, but we know that we can temporarily remove them from our life. So in exceeding the value, what we really need to understand is the fact that we need to exceed the value. And the higher is the things that we are asking someone to do uh, in, the, in the pyramid, the more the exceeding value needs to, needs to go high. The second element is fading. Now, extrinsic value does fade. And this, once again, is linked to the first point, the exceeding value. If I give you $10 and let's say an hour for three years, at the fourth year, even if your job didn't change, you are starting to feeling that you should get more than $10 to do to your job. Even if nothing changed in your job, like even if literally nothing changed, because that is something that it's called marginal utility, or actually is decreasing of the marginal utility. And the point is that the more I give you something, the more you perceive that thing as less available because you are more exposed to it. The rarity of the element disappear. And that's very important because once again, if I give you $10 to give you a task and I give you $10 and $10 and $10 and $10, eventually to doing the exactly same task, I will have to give you $12 and so on and so on. And this is very important in game because one of the things that I see the reason for losing retention, for losing uh, monetization, is maintaining the value given to the player constant. 
if you keep the player, the value that the player received constant within your game, like I purchased this in-game currency and it was 5,000 units of this currency for five euros, the next time I will not perceive 5,000 uh, units of that currency worth five euros. I will not because they are fading the value because I've been exposed to them. They need to increase their value by doing what? For example, changing those value based on how many times the player buys things. Another element of extrinsic is extrinsic requires showing off. And that's why social media works so well. Social media, all social media, Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse, any social media are based on showing off. You know, look how good I am. Look how great I am. Look how intelligent I am. Look how this great vacation I am. Look my great job, my great kids, my great face, and so on. People who has extrinsic motivation wants to show the extrinsic motivation because the more I show off the extrinsic motivator, the higher is the value. If I do an holiday and it was a great holiday for me, that's awesome. You know, I relaxed, I went to the beach, it was fantastic, uh, great sea, great food, whatever. But if I also have a picture to showing off how great my summer was, now the value of the summer is increased because not only it was great because I enjoy going to the sea, but now it's great also because I can show off to that. Now, of course, the risk of that is that showing off leads to toxicity because showing off is an endless cycle in which I show off and you show off in return and show off and show off. You know, the famous, the gra your neighbor neighborhood grass, neighborhood grass is greener. It's a constant cycle. So that is the risk of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, but you still need to use them. Now, before going further, I need to just do a quick detour and it's very important, otherwise, what I'm going to talk later will make no sense. But uh, I'm going to go very fast on this. So once again, if you have questions, please uh, keep them to the end and do and ask them. And then if you have further questions, you have further doubt, you want to discuss more, add me on LinkedIn, I will talk, no problem, always happy. Now, to better understand also uh, motivation, we need to understand the self-determination theory, uh, also called as SDT. Now, the definition of self-determination theory is a macro theory of human motivation, personality, consequence, people, integral. It's a lot of gobbledygook. Really, what it is, is the reason why, for example, for myself, I continue to be a game designer uh, after 13 years, and I left a really easy job after a month because it wasn't intrinsically motivated to me. It wasn't giving me the element of motivation. And regards game design, is the reason why I'm still playing the same medium game for a year and let a highly engaging game after a single game. What I mean by that is that sometimes there are some games and I invite you to reflect on that, that you find, oh my God, this game is fantastic. I just had the most amazing 30 minutes of gameplay in my life. And as soon as you finish those 30 minutes, you never touch the game again. You never, never, never touch that game again. While there are other games that you recognized as being mediocre, medium at best, but you have put 60 hours of gameplay in that, even if it was medium. Why? Because the first game, the 30 minutes long game was highly engaging, was really good sorry, at gameplay, but didn't have any element of the self-determination theory. Because to sustain activity for a long time, you need to have self-determination. Now, is self-determination different from uh, intrinsic motivation? No, it is not. Intrinsic motivation, it's a part of the self-determination theory. It's actually the most important part. Now, in general, the, uh, to understand the self-motivation theory, we need to understand that by the self-determination theory, humans are inherently proactive and they want to master what drives them. Now, this is a long sentence that basically say, humans want to become good at what they like doing. And that is intrinsic motivation. Now, human have a tendency to toward, to, uh, toward growth, development, and integrated function. Now this, once again, long sentence to say basically, humans love to get good at what they do, and they love to find way to use what they do in unexpected or different results. You know, this is the classic like, 
oh, everything I learned could be used in game design or vice versa. I learned these things in game design and now I can apply it to other, uh, I don't know, leadership or cooking. For example, I love cooking too. And most of the time, my metaphor about game design are related to the, to the cooking world. Finally, optimal development and action are inherently human, but they don't apply happen automatically. Now, once again, long sentence to basically say, at the start of a process, humans are terrible at what they do. They want to become good, but they are terrible. Okay, so no one is good at the start, basically. Now, by taking these three elements, which are all linked to intrinsic motivation, we can understand how to uh, give elements that can motivate users or players or uh, anything else to stay motivated for a long period of time, at least with intrinsic motivation. Now, once again, can we go with extrinsic? Yes, by extrinsic motivation is actually easy. If we respect those elements, the said well, the exceeding value, the marginal uh, utility, uh, the toxicity with show off, we can do extrinsic motivation. Uh, sorry, before going that, these three, uh, elements divided in two free great categories, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Now, competence is the idea that you can get you can get mastery of a particular ability. You know, you are bad at playing piano, you will learn how to play piano with a piano, and you do that for many years, and eventually you are good at playing piano. Uh, you play a game like you know, a, a first-person shooter, you go on the multiplayer, everyone destroys you, everyone one-shots you, then you get good, you start to survive more, you get better, and eventually you are the one shotting everyone, in, uh, eliminating everyone with a single shot. Now, the main element of competence are feedback. You need to know, you need to give the player ways to understand what they did, in, uh, right, uh, what they did right and what they did wrong. Now you need exaggeration. Now, feedback and competence needs to be exaggerated, especially at the start. When I am bad, I need to think that I'm good. Once again, think piano. Uh, I don't know if any one of you learned piano or know how to play a piano. If you are starting to learning a piano, now there are those digital pianola. They are basically, uh, you choose a song and the right um, key that you need to press, it's illuminated by a color. So you're starting basically at the start, you just, uh, basically doing a, Q, um, uh, a rhythm in game, uh, uh, hidden as learning piano. Now, do you, are you actually learning piano? Yes, a bit. You are uh, learning, for example, how to at least press the button at the right time, keep the hands in the right position and things like that. But the impression that you have by doing these things is that you are incredibly good because basically just by pressing the right button, you are uh, playing a song which is something that you will not do for at least another like two months after that stage. But his cause is exaggerated, especially at the start, you need to exaggerate the progression of the player to give a sense of competence. Because, because the self-motivation theory tells us that we are at the start really bad at what we do, but we want to become good. If I can see a good start, you know, uh, I believe that I can do it. If I'm motivated because I think, oh, see, how, how was I good? As I started, I was incredible. You know, it gives me confidence. Now you need progression. Progression can be done in many ways, badges, level things. Uh, there are many ways, but you need to give a, a way to the player to understand that they're getting better. Then you need mastery. You need uh, ways to challenge the player. Now, mastery is not absolute. So if I'm learning piano, you don't give me like, I don't know, a Beethoven composition at the start. You have to create mastery challenges based on my current level. And now you need to give me innovation. What I mean with innovation is way in which I can use what I mastered in different ways. Once again, to continue the uh, music uh, metaphor, like I just press random keys and compose a song. Now, I'm actually doing something good. Not necessarily, but I'm innovating. I'm using what I learned, which is so far is the ability of pressing keys to do something else. Now, something very important, especially in video game, is that in video game, we do not need real mastery. Now, remember DDA, which is dynamic difficulty adjustment in games. We need way to add mastery 
So we still need way to give mastery to players, but we also have incredibly, incredibly many elements to fake mastery, to give player a jump start for, uh, for motivation or to just fake their mastery constantly and give them a sense of engagement. Many examples are DDA, dynamic difficult adjustment, the forgiveness, me forgiveness mechanics, uh, manipulation through game design or level design, for example, giving an advantage in their damage, RNG, uh, RPG elements, you know, and this is, I'm the perfect example of that. I finished all the Dark Souls and Demon Souls and Bloodborne, but I am terrible at those games. I'm incredibly bad. So how did Diego manage to finish those games, which are considered hard, if he's really bad? Because RPG element, because there are people who actually finished Dark Souls level one, never got it, using only fist and controlling the character with their feet. They are, go on YouTube and you can see them. I finished Dark Souls at level 200 uh, with uh, basically max stats and I did finish them. And that's fake mastery. That's exactly what it is, fake mastery. I'm not good enough, no matter. I can always increase my numbers and basically cover my inability with numbers. That's great. That's awesome. I felt great doing that. Great system, Devil May Cry. Devil May Cry is fantastic. If you actually watch Devil May Cry, uh, great system, it's awesome because it's not about you are bad, you are medium. It's not, you know, A, B, C, D, or one to 10. No, it starts with awesome, uh, super stylish, incredible, fantastic. You are the best. So it already starts that it gives you fake mastery. The, more, the, um, the, uh, the worst level, it tells you something like, you are awesome. Now, autonomy. Now, autonomy is agency. Okay, so autonomy, if you're coming from the game design world, autonomy is agency. In case you don't know what agency is, I suggest you to read The Paradox of Choice, which is a great book. And basically, uh, uh, agency is the act of feeling in control by your uh, choices, which is not mean having lots of choices. It means to have small amount of choices who are meaningful and you understand the consequences. So once again, feedback is fantastic. Failing is great. Experimentation, awesome. The 20% rule in which you should give 20% of the time of the player for experimentation, this leads to great autonomy and personalization. Meaningful personalization like classing, fighting style, skill, which by the way can be fake, element of fake mastery, are awesome for autonomy. Relatedness is the sense of belonging, being part of something, or the simulation of that. For example, Trico, so The Last Guardian, is great at the relatedness. You are feeling this connection with this kind of weird cat, dog, dragon thing, which is a simulation. No matter, it's great, I feel related. Now, there are many ways to do relatedness. Of course, human beings, so multiplayer is the easiest, but you can have NPC, you can have um, stories, multiplayer, community. The Nemesis system from Shadow of War, Shadow of Mordor is awesome. Now you are probably thinking, okay, Diego, but what does this mean? Well, let's watch ads and in-app purchase. Now, most of the time, ads and in-app purchase are only seen as extrinsic value. And you user perceive them as something that are necessary evil. You know, I start the thing, I get the ad, I get the reward, and I close the ad. It's not good, it's not great, it's not awesome, it's actually really bad. Now, do they, have to this in the, uh, do they have to be in this way? Not necessarily. Now, I want to show you very quickly something from uh, Sonic Dash. Now, Sonic Dash is uh, an endless runner. It's very basic, uh, you go around, collect coins, and he has a ad system. When you, sorry, so why it's, uh, it's so slow, when you die, uh, you get your rings, which are basically your uh, soft currency. Okay. And just a second, as I say, sorry for the delay. Okay, uh, you can watch a video to double your uh, coin at the end of a run. So in this, character, in this case, for example, the character had uh, 2,500 whatever coins. He can watch a video. And if he does watch the video, he gets double the coin. Actually, he collected 400. So if he does watch the video, he gets other 403. So for a total of 806 uh, coin. Now, this is a very standard, a very forward and use system in the in really many uh, Android and iOS games. You collect something, and then I tell you, 
if you take this necessary evil thing, I give you double of that. And now, as you can see, we are wasting an incredible opportunity because we are still presenting ads and in-app purchase as a necessary evil. We are not integrating them with any intrinsic value. We are just pushing with the extrinsic value. Here you can see, 400, watch, get double. Now, when I was working on Donay, I thought to myself, can I do better? Can I make in-app purchase and ads not necessary evil, or at least not perceived as necessary evil. We worked really hard on that, and we actually succeed. So we took the Sonic Dash system, which is double your coin, but we did one crucial different and uh, difference, one crucial uh, element, and this difference was that we put the double your coin not at the end of the ad, of the run. Uh, the game is still an endless runner, but at the start of the, app, uh, of the run, there is a one third of a chance they will be. And the result, this is the, the system that you can see here. Uh, the design was that at the start of the run, there are 33%, three, uh, so one in a three chance that the double uh, coin activity will happen. So at the start of the run, not at the end. Now, if you click on it, you watch a full video ad, and once it's active, you get double the value of the coin. So the coin don't spawn, it doesn't spawn double of the coin. It just consider each coin two instead of one. We did an ABC uh, testing. Uh, and we discovered that A, so at the start, was seeing more than B. E, A was uh, lead to a slower economy than B. So actually people was making less money uh, we also discovered that A lead to a higher gameplay time than B and C. So people was actually playing longer run than when the, the ad was at the end and when the ad was completely absent. Most users found A way less annoying than B. More users, after watching the video, used other monetization system like using uh, the uh, one life more object. And we were shocked. We were like, wow, this is way more than expected. I mean, we wanted to do something different and we were experimenting and we went uh, and we were optimistic, but we were mind blowing how this thing worked so well. And the result is because it's intrinsic motivating. How can an ad be intrinsically motivating? Well, if we actually think about what we talked before, we can understand the reason. Let's start with the, with the first element. Now, this is for the entire game. So Donay has an intrinsic motivation, which is anytime you watch an ad, you also help to donate money to Best Friends Animal Society, which is an, uh, an MPO for animal. But this was true for every single ad in the game, not only for that specific ad. Which, well, which in any case is already intrinsically motivating it because if I care about animal, I want to help them and is intrinsically motivating it. In fact, the entire uh, being a volunteer is based on that. You know, I dedicate my time for free for doing this cause because I believe in this cause. But that was true for every ad. So that was the, the only explanation. The other explanation is the sunken cost fallacy, which can be used to be intrinsically motivating. It. Now, in case you don't know what a fallacy or a bias is, basically the definition is the inability or unwillingness to think or act rationally, reasonably, or sensibly. So basically what it tells you is, is that because we evolved and our brain are still partially linked to our animal uh, past, sometimes we don't, watch well, not sometimes, most of the time, we don't really take decision using pure logic, but we take decision based on few bias and fallacies that are in our brain. Uh, a fallacy is basically a mistake, I believe. For example, I don't know, if I believe that all Italian peoples are loving pizza, that's a kind of stereotype, which is a fallacy. Uh, now, there are causes, say, by evolution, chemical society, for many reasons, and we all have them. Uh, now, some more than others, but there are lots of them. Now, what is the sunken cost and fallacy? The sunken cost fallacy is basically that people who have invested something uh, that can be money or time, are more willing to continue to do the activity that, in which they have invested it, even if they think that the activity is not good enough. So basically, 
uh, when going to the theater was uh, was allowed, if you buy a ticket of a movie and then you read that the movie is terrible, you know, it's like, oh, that's the worst movie ever. Because you bought the ticket, you are probably still going to go to see that movie. Uh, even if he's wasting more time. Now, why this is sunken cost fallacy? And then, and why the, this sunken cost fallacy leads to intrinsic motivation? Well, because what it means is that if you watch this element at the start of your video, you basically did an investment. You invested 30 seconds of your life into having double the coins, which means that if you leave the, uh, the run, so if you, you know, oh, I started bad, I should leave it. I restart the run or if you're playing badly, you wasted 30 seconds of your life. You wasted your investment. You are in the sunken cost fallacy. And this leads to intrinsic motivation because now the only way to actually get the best out of your investment is to play better, is to play with more intensity, is to actually be more focused on the play, play longer. And if you lose, invest more money to get, so taking other object to actually continue to get uh, the best of your investment. And this is sunken cost fallacy, which leads to intrinsic motivation because now I have a reason to be uh, good at this game because I invested time and this leads to a positive circle of monetization. So uh, this is just uh, the, the slide to repeat. So you invested 30 seconds of your life. You have to be good. You're playing better. You play for a longer time because if you uh, avoid, you lose money. Use other chance item. So what is the future? What I want to really tell you with this is take the slides in which I give you the intrinsic motivation, uh, good points and the stretching and uh, the bad points. Take the self-determination theory. Take nudge and manipulations uh, and the bias and fallacies and see how you can link them in order to create intrinsic motivation and then use that intrinsic motivation as a, a monetization point. Skill, which are expressed as the self-determination theory plus bias leads to a better monetization, but not only that, leads to a, a, a more satisfied user because the user don't see them as motivation point, it sees them as investment, as entry points for what they are doing. Now, what I suggest if you want to uh use the best out of it these are the book that i suggested the undoing project how to not be uh wrong uh, predictability and rationality drive and nudge nudge is an economy book in all this book you can find the nudge theory behavioral design bias and fallacy design that you can use in combination because that's the point you need to use them in combination with the self-determination theory in order to generate uh hooks of the skill and then you need to attach these hooks to your uh, monetization point and this it's a virtual circle each one of them push the other and increase user motivation sorry user monetization and user satisfaction now if there are any questions i'm more than happy to to answer Hey there, Diego. Um, How are you doing? Okay. Thank you so okay. much for this. Uh, we we are about out of time because I'm gonna have to go over and bounce over and set up the next, um, the next stream that we have here. Um, is there any any closing thoughts that you'd like to talk about? Well, yeah, there is a question here from Salom uh, Bros. Salom underscore Bros, which is, wouldn't you make a teamwork or collab with more people to make some bigger games? Uh, well, yes, of course, I collaborate with other team. I'm currently working with other team. And in general, collaboration is good for intrinsic motivation. But once again, intrinsic motivation needs that you need to enjoy what you're doing. What I mean is that, for example, let's tell me that uh, I, for example, I love mechanics. I love games with narrative, but I'm not a great narrative designer. So if you tell me, oh, Diego, let's do a narrative game. I would say, yes, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm going to do it. But maybe in two, three months, I will lose that drive because I'm not really enjoying, do, enjoying doing that. And that is the risk of putting uh, teamwork as the only intrinsic motivation element in your game. Because uh, the more people you're putting into it, basically, 
the more uh, you need to be sure that everyone has the same intrinsic motivation. You know, that everyone loves making narrative game, that everyone loves, I don't know, pizza, if it's a cooking uh, team. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. And if you have not, can you please send me your deck so I can put this in there? Oh, I, yep. I did send it. So in any case, uh, if it's oh. not... Oh, uh, do, 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 do. let me look here. I'll, I'll double check. This in skills as motivation. You have sent it to me. Yes. So this deck is going to be available. And uh, for you guys that have signed up um, right here, I'll put the link. We'll be sending out all the presentations from all the speakers to all ticket holders. You just need to have one of the passes from indiegame.business. On there, it's free to sign up. So if you're just watching from wherever, but you want um, the presentations, I've got a bunch of presentations to send out. And thank you so much, Diego. Next, we well, have thank you coming... for hosting. Yeah, thank, thank you. For hosting you. The, the Here, let's put this right there. <laughs> yeah, thank you, for, thank you for participating. <laughs> That's good. To thank you for participating. Next, we have Erica Evans, and she's going to be talking about building your indie life rack. And we'll be live in just a few minutes. So please hang on and hang out. We appreciate you very much, Diego. Thank you so much. This is a great talk. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.